yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fled with the church. Alright, look at turn. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about parallel hash joins. Uh, so this is gonna be the first of a three-part lectures. Or, or three lectures, we're going to talk about how to do hash joins, or sorry, how to do joins, high performance joins. So, this will be the first one hash joins. The spoiler is this is what you're going to want to use in almost any case. Uh, next class after the midterm, or sorry, after the spring break, will be uh, sort merge joins, and then we'll finish up with uh, multi way joins, which is a special case. All right, for the class project stuff, um, I posted on Piazza last week about Project 2, Project 3. I still need to upload the Project 3 uh, info page. I will do that tonight. Um, so Project 2, if you haven't signed up for a, uh, a, a database system yet, I haven't gone through and improved them, I'll do that tonight as well. Uh, please do that if you're looking for. I will also put out a list of the ones that I think are interesting. Yes, question? If we're going to have, if like, the write-up for Project 3 is out like tonight and the proposal is Wednesday, like, what is the proposal like, supposed to be? It's, it's what I talked about last class. Oh. What, what you're going to do, uh, how you're going to do it, how you're going to test. It's like super high level, not anything deep. Okay. It's um, not like a three-page paper. It's not a three-page paper. No, it's slides, literally slides, uh, for five minutes. Uh, and you can fake it by like trying to get your laptop to work for two minutes, right? Like. Okay. Slides. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so, but and also too, I, I saw people signed up that are still looking for teams. I've talked to some of you. I will reach out to again individuals tonight, and we'll start trying to coalesce and get everyone in, into groups and assign to projects in time. Okay. And then I'll be on campus tomorrow if we. I think there's a faculty candidate uh, in the morning, but I'll, I'll be around when we can try to make something. Uh, if you need to talk, we can try to make, make arrangements. Okay? All right, any questions about Project 2, Project 3? And Project 1 was due last night. Uh, some of you got uh, 110%. Congrats. Um, for those who didn't finish, please, please try to finish as soon as possible. Okay? Or reach out to me if something else is going on. All right, so today's class, again, we're going to focus on, on hash joins. So we're going to start, begin with the background of what we need to care about when we do, uh, not just hash joins, but any join algorithm or any, any operator implementation in a database system in, in general. Then we'll focus on how we do a, the parallel hash join and sort of define the building blocks of the steps or the phases of doing the hash join. Then we'll say how do we we'll talk about how do you build a hash table, what do the hash functions look like, what do the hashing scheme look like, and then we'll finish up with the evaluation. Uh, really only two, two graphs from the paper you guys read, which was a, a sort of a deep analysis across a bunch of these different hash joint algorithms that, that have been proposed in the last decade and really trying to understand what makes one better than another because they would have contradicting results saying sometimes one, one implementation was better than another. And so this paper you guys read was trying to clear the air to say, okay, within a single platform, a single system, a single implementation, which hash join uh, approach is going to be the best? And the spoiler is going to be the no partitioning one. It's going to be the best. So I'm going to teach you radix partitioning and, and other ways to optimize that. Uh, the partitioning phase, but in general, like, turns out no partitioning is, is probably going to be the best thing to do because to get the tuning right for, for the, you know, what, what are the, you know, the, the, the number of passes and the, the size of the bits you want to look at in the radix, all, getting all that right per hardware is, is non-trivial. So most systems, as far as I know, are just going to implement the no partitioning approach. Okay. So today's lecture is about how to execute joins on, on a single node. So I don't have a slide discussing this, but think about, again, we're focused on single node execution at this point in the semester. So be, but we are aware that we could be potentially running in a distributed system where there is some higher level orchestration that is moving data around between nodes as needed. So today's class is really like, okay, well, somebody else has got the data to my node, and I'm going to do the join on, on the data that's local to me. So we're not going to worry about, like, if I have to, I have to go pull things over the network, uh, if someone's already done the shuffling for me or did a broadcast join, all that we ignore. It's like the data is on my local box. I want to run the join to produce output. And then where it goes next, at, at this point, we don't care. All right? So, again, and then also emphasizing that we're only looking at how to do joins between two relations or two tables uh, using multiple threads to parallelize their operations. We'll look how to do multi way joins or like th three or more table joins uh, after, after spring break. So to do a join, there's basically two approaches. There isn't any magic to this. It's going to be either a hash join or a sort merge join. And the basic idea is that we want to avoid having to do brute force sequential scans over our, our, our two input tables or relations over and over again. So we either build a, a temporary data structure, like a hash table, to help us do quick lookups to find matches, or we sort the, sort the data 
and then just walk them uh, with iterators and checking across. Right? So we're not going to discuss nested loop joins because in an OLAP system, you almost never want to do this because the data you're trying to join is, not, is going to be large. And chances are you're probably not going to have an index already, already in it. Right? But if you cannot decorrelate it, If you can't decorrelate it, yeah, screw you. Yes, you have to do a nested loop join. We can order that for now. We'll come to that later. Um, yeah, we'll, 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 yes, we'll, we'll talk about nested queries. I think we talk query optimization later on. But best case scenario, assume we can do a hash join. So um, for OTB systems, a lot of them don't actually even implement hash joins. Like MySQL, I think maybe MySQL 8 has it. But for, yeah, I think maybe they just had it. But for a long time, they didn't have it, right? Because in most of the time, OTB workloads, index and nested loop join is what you're going to want to use. And I just want to iterate to say like this is the index and nested loop join is conceptually the same thing as the hash join, except traditionally when you say I'm doing index nested loop join, it's going to be on a B plus tree index. But they're basically doing the same thing. There's some data structure that allows us to do quick lookups. In the case of the B plus tree, it'll be log n. If it's the hash table, average cache, 01. Right? There's some data structure that's going to always have to do a sequential scan over the entire data set to quickly find a matching tuple to do our join. But in the case of a nested loop join, the index is already going to exist. And then when the query is over, the index still exists. In the, in the, in the hash joins we're talking about here, I'm going to spend all the time building this hash table, probe it to do my join, and then throw it away immediately after my query is done. And then the next query comes along, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to build it again. And that's OK. Uh, there is some, some research literature about saving the, sort of the hash tables, image data structures from one query to the next. It's sort of like a materialized view, but not exactly the same. Um, but for our purposes here, assume we don't have existing hash table and we have to build it on the fly. You can do this in some systems. They'll build a B plus tree on the fly. I think SQL Server calls this a spooling index, a uh, spooling scan index, um, a spooling index scan. Again, they build a, a, they build a, uh, a B plus tree instead of a hash table because uh, you know, for whatever the query is, that, that's better. But not everyone does that. All right, so hashing versus sorting is a, uh, is, is a classic uh, a classic debate in databases that goes back to the 1970s. We'll see another similar debate when we talk about uh, query optimizers. Do I go top down or bottom up? Right? There's, sort of the, there's, there's pros and cons to both these approaches. Um, but way back in the 1970s, because the, the machines that they were running on were really limited, had, had a small amount of memory, uh, they had to do external merge sort. So the literature at the time deemed that sorting, sort, mer uh, sort merge joins were better than hash joins. Because right, at least you could have sequential access instead of the random access you have in a hash table. Then in the 1980s, uh, hash joins became the def uh, preferred approach. I think there was a combination of two reasons. There was the, the Grace hash join uh, technique that came out of the Japan, showed how to basically spill the disk if, if necessary by, by partitioning, which is basically what the radix partitioning approach we're going to talk about later on will do. Um, and then there was also this, this movement of, of sort of specialized database accelerators called database, database machines. I think this is like specialized hardware people were building in the 1980s uh, that could do hash joins in hardware. And of course, they all failed because, because of Moore's Law and you know, Intel CPUs and other, men, other you know, Motorola, other CPUs were getting better and better at the time. Uh, and by the time you actually fabbed your database machine hardware and got it out in the market, the, the next version, x86, was out. And you, you, any benefit you got, you lost. So hashing was deemed equivalent in the 80s. Then in the 1990s, there was a paper by Gertz Graffi, the guy that invented the volcano approach we've mentioned a couple of times before. Um, he wrote a paper that basically said the algorithms were, were equivalent. But there really wasn't any major performance difference between the two for the hardware that was available at the time. Then we get into the 2000s. And for the last uh, two decades, uh, hashing has been the, the dominant approach. Um, and this is just a byproduct of like the hardware getting faster, the being clever about where the data, you know, where you're storing the data uh, in memory, um, and just, you know, just better implementations of, of these systems, of these approaches. So 2000s, the, the hashing dominated. 2010s, the question was, should I partition or not partition my, my data before I do my joins? And then the current decade we're at now is no, no partition is deemed the better one. But again, it's still worth understanding what, what this is and then what the, the sorting one is as well. 
which we'll cover next class. So, all right, so this lecture today, we're going to focus on, on these things. So the paper I had you guys read was, as I said, it was a, uh, was a summary of what the, the, sort of the, the previous decade of hash joint implementations look like or, uh, in, in the research literature. And was trying to understand, okay, which one is actually the right, you know, what are the right results we should consider in, our, in when building a new system? Because oftentimes they said contradictory things. So it kicked off, the sort of the modern era hash joins kicked off in 2009 from this paper from Oracle and Intel where they were showing that hashing was better uh, and they had a, a partition, you know, the sort of radix partition approach using this. Although they claimed in this paper that they think sort merge would be better once AVX 512 comes along. Of course, well, AVX 512 wasn't called, called that in 2009. They said once we have 512 bit SIMD registers, we think sort merge is going to be better. The later papers show that actually that's not the case. But this was sort of the first one that said, hey, hashing is better. Then there was a paper from, from the, the people in Wisconsin in 2011 where they looked at the differences between partitioning and non partitioning hash joins. Um, and we'll, we can discuss these results later on, although it's, it's over a decade old now. Then the hyper guys came out in 2012 and said, okay, everybody's wrong. Uh, sort merge is actually better. And even without SIMD, we can, we can get better performance in our system with, uh, over, over hash join using sort merge join. So that was 2012. Then a year later, they came back and said, okay, ignore what we said here. We were wrong. Um, and it turns out you really actually do want to use, use uh, hashing. And if you make it at NumaWare, you, you, know, you can get much better performance. 2013, the same year, the, uh, the, the other Germans, I guess the Swiss Germans at ETH, they came out and said, okay, here's, here's another implementation that extends the Wisconsin guys have done, what, the, what we did, and here's how to get better performance. And then again, the paper you guys read came out in 2016, which basically said everyone is, is, is showing different results. It's not clear what's actually what's going on. It's not clear like, what optimizations are getting implemented in all these different approaches. They try to do a thorough evaluation of, of all these things. Right? And, and the main finding is going to be that the non-partitioning one is going to be, turn out to be superior, both in terms of uh, performance in the common case and in, in terms of implementation. Right? There's a paper that came out in 2015 from the same team uh, uh, from the same people the year before, where they looked at all the different hash table implementations. Um, so this is the follow-up to this, which I, I think is great work. And then where we're at now, the state of the art is the other, the new German, or same Germans, it's hyper Germans, but these Germans building Umbra, uh, they have a version of Radix hash join in, in the, their new system. Umbra is the successor to Hyper that shows that, that the Radix hash join is better marginally, and then the engineering costs of getting that better performance just, just isn't worth it. And you're better off trying to implement no, uh, the no partitioning scheme. The another thing I'll point out too is like, you know, because said, these papers are saying sometimes one is better than another. As far as I know, no system actually tries to implement multiple variants. They usually just pick one hash table implementation, they'll pick one hash join implementation, and that's it, they stick with it. It's not worth the engineering cost to be adaptive or dynamic on the fly based on what the data looks like. Right, there's, there's other things you need to worry about. And then we'll see later on at the end, the, these Germans show that like, you're not really spending that much time when you execute uh, joins uh, in, in query execution. Right, there's, other, there's other things to worry about. All right, so our goals for building this uh, our, our high performance join algorithm are gonna be the following. And I will say that this is gonna be, these goals are gonna matter whether or not we're building a sort of harbor, what is called a harbor conscious algorithm or Harbor oblivious algorithm. And this, this distinction just means like, are we gonna have in our implementation of, of the hash joint algorithm, are there gonna be uh, sort of parameters or knobs that we can tweak based on what we know the underlying hardware looks like, what the cache line size is, what the, the memory access speed and so forth, or the, the you know, L1 to L3 cache sizes, right? So cache oblivious means you build your algorithm without, without having to worry about any of these things. And harbor conscious means like, or sorry, harbor conscious, harbor oblivious means you don't worry about any of these things. Harbor conscious means you are aware of these things in the implementation. So these two goals are still going to matter. It's just whether or not the implementation is going to spend the extra time to try to, uh, in, in being harbor conscious to, to, to achieve these as, uh, even further than what you can get just through careful programming now. All right, so the first thing, the first goal for us is that our hash join, uh, or any, actually for both types of joins, is that we're going to minimize, we want to minimize the amount of synchronization that's occurring between different worker threads running on the same box. Right? So that means that we want to minimize the, the, the 
the amount, like whether it's necessary for one worker to coordinate with another worker about who's going to write into some space or waiting for the data that, that they need to generate, right? Now, it doesn't mean we need, we need to make our, our entire algorithm latch free, because that always doesn't, doesn't mean better performance. It just needs to be, we need to be smart about where we take latches uh, to make sure that like, we're not bottlenecked on you know, a, everyone doing a writing to a single location. The next goal is we want to minimize the, amount of the, the, the cost for us actually going accessing memory. As I said, assume that we're running on a single node. Assume that the data we, that we want to do our join on is already in, brought into memory. Right? We've, already, we've already fetched it in. We've already done the sequential scan. We're upper parts of the, of the query operator, or the query, sorry, the query plan. Everything's in memory. So now when we want to access data, we want to make sure that we, we maximize the locality of the data. Right? So ideally, we want to have a worker access data that's in the same CPU cache, at the very least, maybe the same NUMA region. Um, and then when we bring data into our CPU caches, we want to uh, maximize the amount of the reuse we get out of it before we move on to the next piece of data. Because we don't want to like ping pong, bring data in, do something on it, throw it away, and then bring it back in you know, a, a, you know, a few minutes later, because now, again, we're, we're polluting our cache. We're spending a lot of time doing these memory stalls. So let's focus deep, let's dive, yeah, dive a little deeper into to this one here. So when in our algorithm implementation, we need to be mindful of, our, of, of you know, what's in our CPU caches or what, you know, what's the capacity of our CPU caches. But we also need to be careful about what's in our TLB or in hardware. Because what we don't want to have is we, we have our thread is reading random data and as I said, ping ponging back and forth. And not only are we going to have cache misses install, go out to memory, and go get it, but we also could have uh, misses in our TLB because the, the data we need is not there, or the, the entry is not is not there, right? So like, if, you know, if I need to touch ten tuples, and those ten tuples are in ten different pages, but my my TLB only holds five entries, I don't want to have to go cycle through, uh, you know, bring things in. Evict my TLB, enter my TLB, and then bring another one in because now I'm paying two cache misses for TLB and, and the data itself. All right. So the two ways we can do this, we want to maximize the uh, sequential access, and this means that we try to cluster the data that we want to access, or you know, for what, whatever phase we're in the join, within to be a single cache line. So bring that, that those 64 bytes in, do whatever we need to do on it, and then we're done and move it away. And then we'll see and one optimization we can do. If we have to write out data to, uh, to an output buffer, we can use the streaming instructions to bypass the CPU caches and go immediately to DRAM, to put it out to DRAM, because we know we're not, we're not going to read it, write it back. For random access, again, we, for this one, we can split things up so that the sort of chunk of data that each, each operation or step is going to operate on will be within a single cache line. So, there's going to be this trade-off between the number of instructions we're going to have to execute to compute the join versus the amount of memory we're going to use. And you know, how does this? Uh, it may be the case that the, the extra CPU instructions to partition the data is not going to give us, is not going to outweigh the, the overhead of, uh, sorry, the extra CPU instructions aren't, aren't negating the benefits we're getting, or don't overcome the, the amount of instructions we're executing and the improvement we're getting is not worth the penalty of spending that time versus just blindly accessing data. And that's why no partitioning is going to be better. So all these, while these things matter, the question is, are we going to work, is it worth the time to do the partitioning steps to maximize these goals? Or is it just better just to read the data and maybe be a little more careful what chunks of data we're accessing as we go along? Again, we'll see that as when we talk about the different approaches. All right. So hash join is the, probably the most important operator you could have in a database system. But again, it's, it's sort of like the SIMD stuff, where if you just try to feel like you know, a really small portion of the, of the system, and I try to vectorize the hell out of it, and I'm going to get amazing potential numbers, improvements, but it's all the stuff around the, the, the operator, whatever the, the thing I was trying to run, all the overhead of getting data in and out of that, that sort of small kernel, that's going to be dominating the cost. So while it is important, and every system needs to do this as fast as possible, it's going to be a bunch of other stuff that actually could matter a lot more. Now, I will say, and I'll show this at the end, again, they claim, and the Germans claim that like, for TPCH, some TPCH query, you're only spending maybe 10 to 20% of the time doing the hash join and the overall query. Uh, we have numbers from, from Impala from, from a, a long time ago that show that in their system, and maybe because it was a long time ago, 
they were spending 45% of the time doing hash joins in all of TPCH. So I don't actually know what the real number is. I, I, I think Prashant measured this. I could go back and look. I, I think it's somewhere in between. And I'm more inclined to go with the, 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 the more recent German numbers than the Apollo numbers. But we'll come back to this. But regardless, it's still going to be uh, an important algorithm. We, we need to operate as fast as possible. And again, we, we want, and we want to take advantage of all the additional cores that we're getting, because again, see, Intel's not going to ratchet up the clock speed a lot more. There's going to be more and more cores. So we want to take advantage of all of those cores. Again, this is, and this is all being done independently, whether we're using SIMD or not. So the basic steps of the hash join are the following. So there's three phases, where the first one is optional. The first one is the partitioning phase, where we're going to do a scan on RNS, and we're going to split it up into disjoint subsets, or, or shards, or partitions. Um, based on the, some hash function that we're going to use on the join key. And the idea here is that we want to break it up into smaller groups so that when we go do the subsequent phases, the build and the probe, that we can have worker threads operate on you know, discrete junks and have all that data be local, local to it. So after, again, the partitioning phase is optional. Like you, don't, you don't have to do it. Uh, if you ever, like sometimes there's the grace hash join. Like that's the, the partitioning phase comes from that. The next, you have the, the build phase. And this is where we're going to scan R on the, on, on the outer table. Uh, and we're going to create a, a hash table on the join key. I want to talk about what that hash table could look like and what the hash function will look like. Then in the probe phase, you can scan the inner table, look at its join key, and hash that, and then do a probe into the, uh, into the, the hash table we built in, in the second phase, check to see whether they have a match. If yes, then match the two tuples together and, and then produce the output, and then move on to the next one. Or if we're in a, you know, a pipeline, write it up to the next operator in the pipeline. So the, the big thing about the, the, the paper from th these Germans here is that they're going to include the materialization cost in, the, in this last phase here, the, the probe phase of combining the two tuples and producing the output. Some of the papers that, that their, their site don't do this. They said, OK, I have a match, and then immediately discard everything. Uh, but obviously, that, that's not real. So they, they always include that in, in their execution costs. Because uh, you know, because it's going to affect certainly the caching behavior of the system. All right, so we're going to go through these, to each of these phases one by one, and understand the the you know the, the implications, the pros, the cons, the different design choices we would have for for their implementation. So for the partitioning phase, the the two approaches are basically going to do what are called implicit partitioning or explicit partitioning. So with implicit partitioning, we assume that somebody else in the system, like when they sent data to us or we, we, we loaded it from disk, has already done some kind of partitioning exactly on the join key that we wanted. And therefore, we don't need to do any additional partitioning. We don't need to do any extra pass. The data is already, already in so the, the right uh, locations for us. This is not usually the case. right? You, you can define join keys, but think of now, again, bringing things off disk into memory from these parquet files. It could be just a bunch of random stuff. So maybe within the parquet file, things are partitioned, but if I'm trying to read multiple parquet files, it's all going to be a, a, a mismatch. So with explicit partitioning, the, the idea here is, again, we want to scan the, uh, in this first example here, we're going to scan the outer, outer relation and redistribute it amongst all the CPU cores. Uh, really, we haven't talked about this yet. Sorry, this is flipped around. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't know why this is. Ignore this. I'm teaching you rate of partitioning. Uh, so we're going to divide, divide the, the two tables. Uh, it should be two tables, too, as well. Tie the two tables, split them into the different CPU cores. So then now when, when we go to do the build phase or the, or the probe phase, the CPU cores are operating directly on, on the partitions that they're assigned to. And we can be careful about where, where, the, where it's being located so that when we, re, when, when we split, put, split the partitions up, we put in different NUMA regions so that the worker operates only on its local NUMA region. So we're not going over that interconnect and paying the, the longer latency. So the, uh, again, split the two, two input relations into partition buffers based on the join key. And again, the big goal of this is that the, although we're going to pay this penalty of having to do this partitioning, the extra CPU, the extra instructions, and the extra time we're spending to do it is going to uh, outweigh, or sorry, be less than the extra time we would spend if we didn't do partitioning. Like if we just let the data be where it is, and we have an unoptimized execution of, of the instructions to do the joins. Uh, that's going to be worse as if we didn't do any. But again, the research says that it doesn't always turn out to be the case, and it's better off just not doing it. So for, for if it's a row store, you have to uh, copy the entire tuple, and that can be expensive. 
If it's a column store, then you only copy the data you actually need. It could just be the join and the offset. But it depends on whether you're doing early materialization or late materialization. All right, so the two approaches to do partitioning, if you want to do it, will be non-blocking and, and blocking. So non-blocking, I don't know if they cover this in the, in the I forget the Starlin paper, but the basic idea is that we only have to scan the relation once, uh, and then we just produce the output as, as we go along, just by a simple partitioning scheme, and it will determine what, where we actually do our writes. We'll see that in a second. Um, but then wh while we're doing the partitioning, because we don't need to do multiple passes on it, when we pr put a tuple into a, the output partition, some other thread could pick it up and then do whatever it wants with it. It could, could do the probe or could do the, the build on the hash table side. Right? We don't have to wait for the partitioning phase to be complete before we're moving on to the next one. Right? In the, the blocking approach, or the, the radix approach, approach, we have to scan it at least twice, because the first pass you have to go through and figure out uh, what the, how to break up the data. Right? In the private partition case, or the, the, the radix partition case would be you know, with this histogram thing. And then once we produce the output, sorry, once we do produce his, this histogram, then we go back and start writing through these partitions, and then something else could read it. But that assumes that we may not want to take an, another pass over it again to partition even further, which depending on the, uh, if you have a lot of skewed data, you may actually want to do. And we'll see how we handle this in a second. So typically, uh, when, when you ever see in the literature, they say I'm doing a radix join, a radix ha hash join, it's, it's, with this, it's with this extra partitioning phase. All right, so in the non-blocking non -blocking case, Again, the two approaches are going to be, I can either have a shared partition or a private partition. So the basic idea is like, where's the output, or the, where are the worker threads going to write the data that they're partitioning to? Are they going to write to some global hash table or global partition space, or are they going to write to their own private partitions? And this is, a, this is a good example in computer science where there's no free lunch, where I can, in this case here, I can just have them write into this, this global space and, and be done with it. Uh, once everyone's finished, in this case here, I'm going to write locally, and that can be faster because it would be less last contention because I'm not writing to a shared data structure, but then i got to put it back into a coalesce into a, a single space afterwards, and then that's going to take extra time. So let, let's, let's look at this visually. So here's my data table, all right, and say I'm doing the morsels approach where I'm going to split them up into some number of tuples, to these chunks that are each going to be assigned to a, a single uh, worker thread. So say I want to do the join on, on column B. So I'm going to go through, each thread's going to scan through and access B and then hash it based on whatever my hash function is. And then there'll be some global partitions of the hash table, say we're using a change hash, change hash table here, that I'm just going to split them up and write them at rotten into. Um, actually, this is not even a chain hash table. These are just linked lists of, of, of blocks of buffers. right? And so if I want to update now this, uh, the, you know, these linked lists, because it's a shared data structure, meaning any worker can write into it, I got to protect them with latches. So once I acquire, once whatever thread acquires a latch, then I can append the next entry to it. So this is, it's an easier to implement because everyone's just writing to the same space. I don't have to do any cleanup afterwards because once everyone's finished their scan over the data table, this thing has everything that it actually needs, but I could have contention if everyone's trying to write into the same partition. Uh, and I, I'm getting, you know, getting latch contention. Private partitions is basically the same thing, but now every single, uh, every single worker thread has its own local partitions that they can write into. They don't have to take latches because nobody else is writing to the same space that they are. But then when this is done, uh, then I have to coalesce them back to the, to the global partitions because this, you know, this P1 here has data. You know, I need to know that P1 and P1 and P1, and P1 here are put together into a single P1, because otherwise I could, I, guess I could have false negatives. So now what you do is you have, uh, for each, each level of local partitions, you have assigned one worker thread to go through across all the different local partitions and then combine the results into the single output. And at the same time, you do, think, you do the same thing with the other one uh, and, and the last one as well. Again, this is occurring in parallel. So again, the end, the end state is that I have a bunch of these partitions with, with, with my data in them. Okay. All right. So now with radix partitioning, the idea here is that it's basically the same thing, but instead of 
in, in these previous examples here, I did one pass over the data. So each thread went through the data once, and I wouldn't call this a pass when you do this copy, because this is just literally just this mem copying into, uh, in, into the global partitions. So with Radix partitioning, you gotta do one pass over the, the table and compute a histogram of the number of tuples per, per hash key um, for some, some Radix, so we'll cover that in a, in a second. Then you use this histogram to figure out within the global partition space where each thread is gonna write into. So this is like a coordination step that you scan through the data, compute this histogram, then you distribute the histogram across all the worker threads, and then they can use that to figure out, okay, if I'm writing into this worker thread, sorry, I'm writing into this offset within my partition space, here's, here's, here's where I should write into. And I know that I don't need to coordinate with any other thread because no other thread is going to write into the same space that I am. So then you, so with this histogram, you compute the prefix comma, and then you scan through it, and then the writing phase occurs in this last step here. And again, if you want to do recursive partitioning, because you have a lot of skew and you have one partition that has a ton of data, you can, you can loop back around and run this again. All right, so let's first cover what a radix is, and then let's cover what a, a prefix sum is. And we'll see how to put this together to, to do this, uh, these three steps. So a radix of a key is just going to be the, the value within some position of the, of, of the key itself. So assuming we have integer keys, so think, think of like you know, keys 19, 12, 23, and so forth. The, a radix would just be like, what's the position of a digit within you know, in, in one position here, right? the, the first position. So for these, the radix would be 9, 2, 3, 8, 1, and 4. And then likewise, I can do the same thing for the second position here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to compute the radix, uh, which is just bit shifting and multiplication, get the radix for some, the first position of the hash key, and then from that, we're going to then compute a histogram to say, okay, for every radix, what's the number of elements that I have in my, in my input sequence here? And then we're going to use the prefix sum, we'll show on the next slide, then that's going to help us determine where the offset is going to be. So the idea is that for a key that shows up, I say this is the hash, key, hash value of it, and I first radix is 1, then I know that there's going to be three other uh, values of 1 that I need to write into my, my partition space. And therefore, I know what worker thread I am. I would know what offset I'm allowed to write into. So the prefix sum is how we're going to get to determine that offset. Prefix sum is just taking a sort of a, a, a moving summation of an input sequence, where each value that, that's produced in the in the output sequence is the sum of the values up to that point. Right. So the very beginning, the prefix sum of the first element is just one, but in, in the for the second uh, element and the prefix sum, it's whatever the, the previous summation was plus the new value, so just three. And I just do this all, all down the line for all of these. All right, so now you can see where I can use that histogram that I had before, going back here. So now, like, see, the numbers are two, three, and one. So my prefix sum would be two, five, and six, and that would tell us again what offset I'm gonna, I can write into safely. So actually, I found this out today. Uh, there's a paper from Guy Blalock from like 1990 where he says, hey, wouldn't it be great if SIMD had this uh, to do prefix sum? Because that's really important. Um, as far as I can tell, there isn't a, a SIMD instruction that do, do, does exactly this. Like it's, it, it's a bunch of bit shifting stuff to make it actually work. And it, I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's performant, at least in the current AVX 512. <laughs> right, so, so, but I'm saying Guy's awesome. He, he thought of this stuff, what, 30 years ago. OK, so let's see how to put this all together, OK? So assuming here we've already, we've already, uh, we've already divided, divided up um, the, the data into morsels. And so we're going to have uh, the, 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 the worker threads scan through our, the input sequence. And again, assuming these are, these, are, these are the values of the hash of the keys after we already hashed them. But we would obviously hash them on the fly. Just for simplicity, I'm showing it like this. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have look at the first offset, the first radix, and we're going to compute a histogram. Uh, each, each worker thread is going to produce a histogram and say what's the number of keys that hash or have this sort of this radix value here, All right? So you just go through, scan through, and produce this output here. So now the histogram for this guy is partition zero, so one, zero here. There's two elements or two, two keys, and partition one there's two as well. For here, for for partition zero there's one, and then for partition one there's one, two, three. 
Right? So this is the history of my compute by looking at the radix. So then now, assuming I have, again, this giant output buffer here, where I want to put all my, 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 my tuples in after partitioning them, I can use, again, the prefix sum to determine where should, uh, where should each worker thread be allowed to start writing the keys that it finds when it scans through back the second time or the second pass. Right? So for, for worker thread 0, partition uh, 0, it's the first element, so this prefix on would be zero at this point, so it writes there. Uh, but then, the, since now for, for partition zero for the second worker thread, it would write to here. And again, as they're scanning through, this, I'm showing two, two worker threads here, but obviously, I think if there was you know, 32 of them running in parallel, uh, they don't need to coordinate about who's writing into what because the, they've already pre computed where they're allowed to start writing. All right, so there's no synchronization cost. Uh, other than waiting for everyone to say, okay, did you compute your histogram, exchange data, then, then, then compute this, which is not that expensive to do. Right? So same thing for partition one. They can write here safely without coordinating. So now, again, they do, they do the second pass, uh, scan through the data, and then populate the, uh, the output partition appropriately. So this is a simplified version where I'm just showing like the hash keys, but think of like it would be the... the the, you know, the keys plus the actual tuple itself that we're actually writing here, not just like you know, 32 bit numbers. So now, if I, if I had a lot of skew, say partition, partition, uh, partition zero, partition one, in the build and probe phase, if I just have two worker threads, I could let uh, CPU or worker zero take partition zero and CPU one take partition one. But let's say in this case here, I'm only, it's three versus what? Three versus five. But assume that was like you know, 10 versus 10 million. Uh, the size of the partition, maybe I want to partition this again. So I, I could just rerun the same algorithm recursively do, and do another two passes on this partition to divide up even further. Right? And then, then, it's, then, then you're looking at the next radix digit and it's, it's doing the same thing we did before. So again, most systems will just do this, just do, do sort of one, one round of the two pass algorithm. Uh, for disk-based systems, sometimes they, 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 go to, they go to more than one just because they want to divide up even further to fit uh, page sizes on disk. Again, in, in practice, I, it depends on how much skew there is. Yeah, again, the, the, how do I say this? Hashing does alleviate some things, but if everyone has the same join key, the exact same value, then no amount of like, partitioning is going to help you because all, they're all going to hash the same thing. All right, so any questions so far? Yes? Isn't this uh, like finally will be partitioned? What is uh, The question is, it, it, will, it, will this end up being a sorted list? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by sorted? Sorted on what, the join key? Yeah. But it's hashing, so hashing's random, right? So you, you don't have any sort order. But if you, like... It's, it's clustered, right? So like all the... Like all the tuples with the radix zero, they're all together, but there's no guarantee that you know within within this you know this this cluster that they're going to be ordered based on the join key. It's, so it's not sorted. So basically, the partition can be uh, disordered. The, within a partition, they're unsorted, but yeah, they, they are grouped together. I'm using the word clustered. Maybe that's a better word. Gr they're grouped together based on the partition value, the like the, the, the radix of the the radix that we generated. So the question is, when we write it out to the, to the output buffers, we don't need to put it in order. You actually can't, right? So going back here, like at this point here, or before this, like all we know here is that part, worker one is going to write partition one data here. It doesn't know what, what's in worker zero's data. So how could it then, like how could you write it here but then also be sorted within partition one? Because this is partition one here entirely. So you don't want to coordinate with this other worker threads. You can't sort things. You don't want them. You don't want to sort things. You don't need to. Uh, but, but partition zero's uh, algorithm will always be on top of the partition one. Right? Partition one's element is always on top of partition one. Does that matter? So when you like shift every base, then like I think uh, eventually like this will be sorted. 
when you shift everything, what do you mean? Sorry. So uh, you guess the first pass, uh, the first uh, bit is for the. I think he's saying that you cursively, like you just keep you, uh, 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 through cursive partitioning, and then it'll be like shifted. Or it'll it's like shifted. What's that? Uh, it's shifted. That it. So you, you first, like if you want to order by. Um, a, B, C, you oh, know, I, first by A, or first by C. Yeah, 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 I, okay, yeah, I got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, 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 all right, I understand. Yeah, sorry, this phase, no, but if you recursively, you're just looking at every single radix. Uh, uh, so again, would, would, are you saying, would you be globally sorted within a partition? But it's just sorted by hash It's, it's still not sorted so by hash like globally, but like, uh, yes, globally, yes, but like, it's, you can't do anything with it though, because you have to do hook, look up the hash table and that's gonna be another ra random access. I don't think you can take advantage of it in any way. They're just sorting by the hash result instead of those. Yeah, you still have to go, you, you do a probe in the hash, key, hash table anyway, that's gonna be random. And then within the, depending on hash, what hash table you're using or hash, hash new scheme you're using, that's going to be a, a sequential, sequential scheme within that. I don't think there's nothing, unless the hash table is sorted, which it won't be, you don't get any benefit from this. But that's, that's an interesting observation. Okay. All right, so there's two optimizations that the, uh, the paper points out they, they claim uh, makes a big difference. The first one is these software write combined buffers, and the idea here is that in uh, in my example here, I was showing that the partition the, the worker threads were just writing through this global partition space, right? And it gets on PowerPoint, so who cares? There's not a you know it's not, not a real system, but if it was actually writing to a you know continuous chunk of memory like this, it could be really bad just doing this. Uh, Sort of this, this random access, uh, going back here, like I write to this partition, then I write this other partition here. Uh, and what you instead want to do is have a little buffer that's local to your, uh, to each worker, worker and write, write all your, your new updates there. And when that's full up to a cache line, then you write that all once in a batch out to uh, the memory space, right? And this one removes the pressure on the TLB and, uh, Improves cache locality in, in, in the data you're accessing, right? So it's similar to the private partition stuff we saw before, but uh, you don't have to do that separate write phase where the worker threads scan through and, and combine everything uh, afterwards. I can still get the same benefit of everyone sort of writing locally, and then they write out a batch to get better performance. And then the next one is the streaming write stuff that we talked about before. Again, as I'm writing out this partition, the data to, to my you know, partition, uh, uh, partition output buffer, I know I'm potentially not going to have to read it again. Again, ignoring recursive partitioning. So as soon as I write data out into here, right, I do this right, I know I'm not going to go back and try to read what I just wrote. That's going to come later when I do the build or, the, or, the, uh, or the, the, the probe and the hash join. So there's instructions in x86 to call what are called streaming writes where I can write to this memory location and it bypasses the CPU cache and I don't pollute it. I know you can do this with SIMD. I don't know if you can do this for, for regular, uh, regular, re regular scalar uh, variables, right? Again, so the combination of these two things, and we'll see this when they do the optimized evaluation. Uh, you know, this is going to get much better performance over like again, basic implementations. There's other optimizations that they cover, like being a numa aware, which we covered before, um, and I'll, I'll talk about a few other uh, tweaks we can do as well. All right, so now. We, you know, we, we've done partitioning. Now we want to do the build phase. And again, the idea here is we scan on the outer table on R, either the tuples themselves or the, partition, or the partitions of them. And then for each tuple we find, we're going to hash it based on the same hash function we used before, and then write it out to some location in our hash table. And if we're doing, uh, you know, if we're organizing the data in the hash table as buckets, we want to have sort of these, these buckets be equivalent to a few cache lines and ni nicely aligned so that we're not paying the penalty of, of unaligned access. 
So a hash table is a combination of, of, sort of two components. Um, so when people say, I have a hash table, it's, it's going to be, you, you need two of these things. The first will be a hash function, and that's going to be taking a arbitrary value, such, such as our join key, and mapping it to some smaller domain, typically a 32 or 64-bit integer, um, and then it, the, which will be random. Um, and the, we want to focus on this, this or with the cognitive of this trade-off between, for a hash function, to how fast it's actually going to be to compute the hash versus what the collision rate is going to be. And we'll, we'll cover that, looks like, in a second. And then the second piece is now, after we, when we do a hash on our, on our values, our join key, we're invariably going to have collisions. The question is, how are we going to handle collisions in, in our data structure? So there, again, more trade-offs here between, do we have a really large hash table, which won't have any collisions, or do we have a smaller one and have collisions and then have to pay the extra instructions to, where, to find places to insert data and find, find the key when we want to do a lookup later on? So we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go quickly on uh, both of these because Again, the main, the main takeaway is going to be uh, XX hash on Facebook is going to be the fastest hash function, and then the uh, linear, hash, linear probing hash table will be the fastest implementation. But I do like to cover like cuckoo hashing and hopscotch hashing, just in case you guys, so you guys are aware that these things exist. I'll explain why you don't want to do them, so that when you go in the real world and someone says, hey, we should use this, this, this fancy hash table, you just say no. Um, we, we can point to this lecture. All right, so. For a hash function to hash join, we don't care about cryptographic properties or guarantees. We don't care about being able to decrypt it. It's a one-way hash. So we want something that's really fast and has a low collision rate. The best hash function you can have, being the fastest, would just be always return one, right? Because it's the simplest thing to do. It's, 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 you know, it's just copying one data from a register to another register. But of course, that's going to have a terrible collision rate because everything, no matter what key you give it, it's going to hash to, to one. The best collision rate would be would, 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 would be the slowest is what is called a perfect hash function. And this is a theoretical concept where no matter what key I give it, I generate a, a guaranteed to be unique hash value. So again, this, this is in the research literature. Uh, you can't actually build this because the way you actually implement it is with another hash table. So you have a hash table for your hash table. And like, <laughs> you see, nobody does this. So, for the latest up-to-date uh, numbers on what the fastest hash function is, there's this, there's this uh, benchmark from, called SM Hasher, which I think is from the Murmur2 guy, uh, or the Murmur hash function guy. But he basically has like, this, this like, stress test for these uh, different hash functions that are out there. And he, you can measure like, the, the collision rate versus like, the performance. So I don't want to cover too, spend the time on this, but here's a bunch of hash functions. The, new, the modern era of hash functions started, I think, in 2008. Where some random, rando on the internet built murmur hash, he put it out there, and then people started using it because it had like this nice trade-off between collision rate and performance. The Facebook, or sorry, Google took this and they forked it, and that became I think City Hash. Um, the guy that built SC, uh, Z standard, the compression stuff we talked about before, he built XX hash, which again this is still considered the state of the art. There's I think XX hash three is the latest one, and it performs really well. Uh, and then 2016 was Highway Hash. Uh, there's, there's a follow-up to farm hash, but you, again, you wouldn't use this for a hash join. So this is a micro benchmark that I run uh, uh, a, with a different framework, and just measuring if you, for different key sizes what the, the throughput is. And again, you can see, again, XX hash 3 just blows everyone away. And the sawtooth pattern here is, is, the, is the cache line sizes, right? That like, when I, when I have another cache miss, uh, when I'm doing these hashing, uh, as the key gets bigger and I fill up my cache, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting more throughput. I'm, getting, I'm, I'm processing more data. So this ran, I ran this benchmark on uh, my desktop machine. And then I ran it again on Dev 12. And Dev 12 was much slower. I have, I have to look at see what's going on, which is supposed to be a newer CPU. Um, anyway, so city, city and farm hash don't use SIMD. I don't think XX hash uses SIMD. So none of these are, I don't think are using SIMD because Using SIMD makes it less portable, and they're trying to be a general purpose thing, right? All right, so again, we're going to use, we're going to use XS hash in, our, in most systems, and then we try to pick up what a hashing scheme is. So I'll quickly go through these. Again, linear probe hashing will be the most important one, or the most common one. Chain hashing is probably the second most common. And then these show up from people that sometimes like, oh, this looks clever. Let's try to do this. Uh, but you, unless you know what you're doing, you probably shouldn't. Like, for example, the, before the pandemic, we had the guy that the, 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 the co-founder of InfluxDB, he came and gave a talk at CMU. 
He mentioned they were using Robinhood hashing. Dave Anderson was in the audience and asked him why. And he said one of his engineers saw it on Hacker News. It seemed like a cool thing, so they implemented it. But it's like, <laughs> that's not a good reason, right? The research literature clearly shows that linear probe hashing is the better approach. All right, so with Jane hashing, this is what most people think about when they, you, you get a hash table in Java, um, when you say you have a hash table. Um, and the idea basically is that there's going to be these, these linked lists of buckets uh, for each slot in a hash table. And to handle collision, we basically follow the, the linked list until we find a position where we can, uh, a free space where we can put our key. Right? And then when we want to do a lookup, we have to scan the entire uh, bucket chain for, for our slot. And we either refine the key and we stop, or we reach the end and we know that it doesn't exist anymore. So conceptually, it's basically going to be the same thing as a linear probe hash table. But the linear probe hash table has this giant you know, single size array, whereas the change hash table can expand because you decrease the size of, of the chain over time. So let's say these are the keys I want to get in there. And these are my bucket pointers, and these are my buckets. So for key A, I hash it. I land in this bucket. I find the first slot. I can write it here. For key B, uh, again, hash there. I can write it there, C, so forth. Now for D, when I land in this bucket, both slots are occupied. So what I do now is just extend the, the chain for this location, this, 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 this part of the, the, the hash table, and create a new page or create a new block of memory, and I write my entry to D there. And I can do the same thing for E, F, and so forth. So one optimization that Hyper does, which I think is clever, because they use a change hash table, is that for the pointers that they're storing in, in this sort of slot array here, as well as the pointers that they're storing between buckets, they actually store the memory address, which is actually only 48 bits in x86, and then use the remaining 16 bits for a balloon filter to tell you whether the key you want is in there. So everyone, know, everyone understand this. So like, when you allocate a 64-bit pointer in x86, it, is, it, you know, it does take 64 bits, but the hardware only uses the first 48 bits. So you can't really have two to the order, 64 you know, locations of memory. It's two to the 48. And the reason why they did this, Intel did this, was because you know, when, when they, they knew nobody actually really needed 64 bits, but instead of making like weird 48-bit registers, they just said, let's just make it 64 bits. And then the, the hardware only addresses up to 48 bits. So that, you know, when you allocate a, uh, you know, a pointer that's 64 bits, there's 16 bits. You can put whatever you want in there, and the compiler doesn't care, and the hardware doesn't care, and it'll ignore it. So they just use that extra 16 bits to put a balloon filter to tell you, is the key you're looking for actually in, you know, going to be in the, along this chain? Right? You can have false positives, because that's balloon filters are approximate data structures. So you could follow the chain and not actually find the need, thing you need. But it could save you doing, doing, doing additional lookups, because the balloon filter will tell you the thing you want is definitely not there, and you, you can skip it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's based on the line. Yeah, so, so his statement is if, if, if you're using memory aligned uh, in C++, you can, uh, you can know that you don't need the full 48 bits, and you can make the balloon filter even bigger. Yes. Uh, we, we used to do tricks, not for balloon filters, we used to do memory alignment tricks like that in, uh, in noise page. The look up stuff in Apache Arrow. We, we can take that offline. All right, linear probe hashing is basically the same concept, but instead of having this version, this, this, this bucket chain that can get extended, I just have this giant, giant array. And so the way I'm going to resolve collisions is that I'm going to scan until I find either an empty space in my, in, my, in my array, at which point I, I can do my insert, or I find an empty space because I'm doing a search and I know that the key I'm looking for isn't there. And I, if, I, if I reach the end of the array, I can wrap around and start from, from the top, from, from the beginning, start over. And obviously, I need to keep track of where I started or entered the hash table so that if I loop back around and hit the same space, I know that the thing I'm looking for isn't there, or there's no more free spaces, and therefore I can stop and break out of an infinite loop. So it looks like this, same, same keys I want to sort or store in this. Hash A, I land here. Hash B, you land there. Hash C, I go here, but A is already occupied. So I just go down to the next free spot, and then I, I can put C in there. Same thing for D, uh, and E will go again, go, go here. So again, if I'm doing a lookup on E, I would hash it here, and I would do my comparison. Does E equal A? No, skip to the next one. I keep going until I find either the key I'm looking for or an empty spot. And the same thing for F, right? So for this one, you pay the same penalty for both on the, the build side and the probe size. 
the probe side to do these lookups because uh, because you know you could have collisions that like the cost of trying to find something is the cost of the same trying to insert something when I have collisions. We'll see examples in a second where, where the the sort of extensions to this will try to shuffle things around so that lookups will be faster than inserts. And again, depending on what your workload looks like, that may be the right right choice. But in practice, it actually it, it usually doesn't pan out to be the case, right? So this is always always going to be the fastest because it's so simple, and there's no indirection. There's no there's no I mean, there's no like I mean, there's branching because you have to decide whether to jump to the next thing or not. But there isn't a bunch of once once data is stored in the hash table, you're done. You don't have to go back and move it, move it later on. So. So there was this sort of thought in the literature for a while that basically said, hey, it's clear that if you're building a hash table uh, it, you know, with a certain number of keys, but then I'm going to probe it a lot. Right? I'm, more, I'm going to read the, the, the data structure more than I'm going to write to it. Then maybe it's worth the, the, the overhead of doing a little extra work when I'm writing to it to move things around so that when I read the data, it's, it's more likely to be in the position I'm, I'm looking for. Right, so if I want to avoid this 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 long search when I do inserts and uh, and lookups, I just make a really big hash table so that means guarantees or reduces the the likelihood of a collision. But there may be other tricks we could do potentially that could shuffle things around so that when I do my lookups, I find the thing that I want right away. So the first technique would be Robinhood hashing. And the idea here is that we want to extend linear probe hashing where we're going to allow for workers to steal locations or slots in the hash table from rich keys and give them to poor keys. And the defining rich versus poor is the number of hops you are or steps away you are from where you should have been if there was no collision. So the idea is that if I, I have one key that's already in my hash table, but it's, they're, they're really close to where they should be, and the new key I'm trying to insert is really far away, I'm better off swapping the, the position uh, and having the, the poor key be closer than, than, than they would have otherwise been in regular linear probe hashing. Right? So it looks like this. So going back here, I insert A here. And so now I need to store whatever the hash key is as well with the original value. But now I'm also going to store the number of hops I am from, or positions I am from where I should have been if there was no collision. So with the empty hash table, A lands exactly where it should be. Therefore, it's, it's zero, zero jumps away from what it should be. Same thing with C goes up here. Or sorry, B goes up here. He's fine. But now I, I want to insert C. C. C wants to go where A is. But at this point here, C is zero hops from where it should be. A is zero hops where, where it should be. So C will leave A alone. And then C goes down here. But now we update C's counter to say I'm one hop away because I'm I should be up here, but I'm, I'm, I'm down here. I'm one away. Now I do a uh, insert with D. So at this point here, D is zero hops away because it wants to go here. But C is already occupied. But C is one hop away, so it's greater than, than where D is. So C, D is not allowed to steal from C. So D just goes down here. Now I insert E. Same thing. Zero, both E and, e and A are zero hops. So A stays where it is. At this point here, C is one hop, E is one hop, so they stay, stay where they are. But now at this point, now E is two hops, uh, whereas D is one hop, so two is greater than one. So at this point, E is allowed to steal from D, shoots him in the head, steals his position, and then now the, we have, the worker thread has to go figure out where to put D back in. So D land, ends up landing here. Right? So now on average, uh, if I do a lot of lookups on, on E and D, the, the distance is basically going to be the same. Right, is the same. Then F goes, goes down here, right? So anything, I guess, why this is bad for performance? It's a bunch of copying, right? Like, going back here. So I, 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 you know, I got to find out where to put it. Oh, I'm going to take this one. So, so, so I got to copy D out, put it somewhere in a buffer, then write an E, and then put, go down and put D here, right? And that doesn't, that's not for free. So even though, again, we're doing this on the build side and not the probe side, it's gonna, it's, you know, the overhead is just going to be way too much. 
And then the benefit you get when you actually do the probe is going to be marginal compared to this. Because also, too, this is unbounded, right? I can just keep going and trying to you know, swap, 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 swap back and forth, right? Until uh, I finally find a position that I'm, that I'm, that, that's free and, I, and where everything's all balanced out. Sure, yes, simple case, sure, this is fine, but on average, not, not, not so much. So Hopscot hashing is a modern variant of Robinhood hashing. Robinhood hashing came out in like 1985. This is from 2008. So it's a variant of, of linear probe hashing where, again, we're going to allow, uh, we're gonna allow keys to steal positions from other keys, but we're only going to do it in the context of what they're called neighborhoods. And so this is a way to bound how far away you, you, you have to look or how far away you have to move something when you start trying to shuffle, shuffle things around. And the idea here is you want the, the size of a neighborhood to be uh, you know, a single cache line or a small number of cache lines so that at least when you're, when you're trying to decide where to shuffle things around, you're not paying penalties to go out to memory and, and figure out, where, you know, is, it, is it OK to put something there? I try to look only for the things that are, that are already in my CPU caches. So we have to have a guarantee that a key has to be in its neighborhood uh, or doesn't exist at all. So again, Robinhood hashing, I can keep moving, shuffling things around. Actually, linear probe hashing, I keep shuffling things around indefinitely until I loop back around and I have an infinite loop and I'm done. In hopscot hashing, we're going to bound it to a neighborhood, meaning like even if I have extra free space in my hash table where I could put something, if it doesn't fit my neighborhood, then, I, then I'm considered full and I have to you know, stop blow away the hash table and rebuild it to be double the size it was, right? So the, the, the high level goal what they're trying to do is that because they're keeping things in the same cache line, the, the cost of going looking up and getting the neighborhood should be the cost of, of, of actually trying to find the key within that neighborhood. Because you already paid a penalty for, for the, ca the cache line missed to go do, do the lookup. That's the overarching uh, goal what they're trying to do. All right, so for this simple explanation, I'm saying the neighborhood size is three. So the neighborhoods can, will be overlapping. So for this sort of first position here, this is neighborhood one, two, three, four, and, and so forth, right? And then for the bottom ones, like neighborhood six, it can wrap around and, and start at the, at the top again, all right? All right, so I want to start A. So this is, it's in this neighborhood. Again, I can, I can insert it into any, any of these slots within this neighborhood, and that's considered fine. But in practice, you always just put the first one, all right? So A goes there. And then B wants to go this. That's its neighborhood, so it'll go up there. Now I want to insert C. C is in the same neighborhood, neighborhood as A. A is occupied, so just like linear probe hashing, I just scan down until I find a free slot, and then I can put C there. D wants to go where C is. This is its neighborhood. Again, same thing. Scan down until I find D, uh, empty slot, I can write that. All right, so now I want to insert E. But E goes where A is, and so if I scan through, I'm going to see that all the positions in my neighborhood are occupied. So again, we have to have the guarantee that a key either it doesn't exist or it exists in its neighborhood. So what it needs to go do is now go back and look at the keys that were in the, that it just scanned through and figure out whether any of those could be shuffled to, to another position and still be in its neighborhood and everything's fine. So I sort of keep track of like a, the stack of here's all the things I just passed through when I couldn't find my free slot. And I would see, OK, well, we'll for, for uh, I'm putting, it should, be, it should be, yeah, sorry, D hashes here, this neighborhood, but this, it's in this position here. So for D's neighborhood, neighborhood 4, it can move down here, and that's just fine. It's still in its neighborhood. So now with this, I can go put E in, in that position there. Right? And then for this last one, F, it just goes at the, at the bottom here. So again, it's, it's like Robinhood hashing where we can move guys, steal their position, uh, but rather than keeping track of like, this number of positions away, it's just implicitly based on where they're located, whether you determine whether or not you're, you're in their neighborhood or not. All right, quickly, cuckoo hashing. Um, I, this one I do think shows up in real systems. I think IBM DB2 Blue did cuckoo hashing. Uh, I forget the number of, of hash tables they used or the number of hash functions they used. The basic idea here is that uh, the, you're going to have either, you could have multiple tables. I'll show you the multiple tables. You could have a single table just with different hash functions. But the idea here is that when I do an insert, I'm going to hash it multiple times, the key multiple times, find different positions, and I find whatever, whatever one's free. 
And if one's not, if, if, if both, or the, if all the positions I'm trying to look at, if they're not free, I'll steal one of their, steal one of the keys that were then there, put my key in there, and then move it, move the key I took out to some other location. So you have the same problem that you had in Robinhood hashing and Hopscot hashing, where I'm paying this copying penalty to, to balance things around. But the, the benefit is that when I do my scans, or sorry, my probes, I'm definitely going to have O1 lookup because I'm going to immediately land to where, where the, the key should be, or it's not there. All right, so say I have two hash tables, two hash functions. I want to insert x. Uh, both of these, uh, the first hash function ha goes here. Second hash function goes there. I flip a coin and I decide, OK, I'll write x here. Now I want to insert y, can hash it twice. First hash function maps to where x already is, so that's occupied. Second hash function goes to this, this position here. That's empty, so I can put y there. But now I come along with z, and for both hash functions map to locations in the two hash tables that are occupied. So now we're going to flip a coin and decide, OK, let's go steal the, the position of, of, of the, 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 on the second hash table for y. So z is going to get inserted there to overwrite y. But now we pull y out, and now we've got to put it back on the other hash table. Right? So we hash it. It lands here, and x is located here. So again, we can go steal its positions. We take x out, put y in. Now we're going to put x back in. So then we come back to the other one, hash that, and we finally find a free slot. If we loop back around and, and recognize that we're back to where we started, whatever key we're trying to hash and put in, or pointing to two locations that are already occupied that we've already seen, then we know we're in an infinite loop, and we have to stop and kill us and, and rebuild the hash table to be double the size it was. Again, same thing. Nice O1 lookups, but the, 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 the build phase is expensive because now of all this extra copying. OK? And hopscotch hashing, I don't know if anybody actually, anybody actually implements that. I just, I just find it kind of, it's a, it's a different, it's a variation of Robin, hashing, of Robin Hood hashing, and I like it. OK, so now we have our hash table. So now we got to do the probe. Uh, there isn't any magic to this. We, you know, if we partition the data, then each worker is going to scan through the partitions. Otherwise, the, you, you break up into morsels or whatever chunks you want. And we're going to scan through, use the same hash function that we did to do the probe and the partitioning phase, do a lookup in the hash table we built in the build phase, check to see you know, wh whether we have a match. If so, then we produce our tuples, uh, and combine our tuples together and produce the output. All right? So the one optimization you can do comes from vector-wise. Uh, and what happens is when you do the build phase and you build your hash table, you also build an auxiliary bloom filter on the side that tells you whether, whether, the, uh, tells you whether the key you're actually looking for is even in the hash table. Right? And the idea here is that the cost of doing the lookup in the bloom filter is so cheap relative to the hash table lookup, then it's just go check that first, and it's always, it's always going to be worth it. So the idea here, I want to join A and B. So A is going to have to build, you know, on the build side, it's going to build the hash table, but it's also going to build some bloom filter. And then now when I start doing on the, on the probe phase with B, I pass that over to B. B checks the bloom filter first. If the key it's looking for is found in the bloom filter, then it does the actual lookup in, in, the, in the hash table. If not, if the bloom filter says it's not there, then you know it's not there because you can't have false negatives, then you don't even bother doing the lookup in the, in the hash table. Right? So the vectorwise guys report that you get about a 2x performance speed up for really selective scans. Like if, if most of the things are not going to be found in the, in the hash table, then this bloom filter is going to crush it, you know, crush performance. All right? It's like doing a predicate push down, but the information that you're, you're generating to tell you whether the, the tuple would even match is generated on the other side, on, on, the, on the build side. And again, from a strict relational model standpoint of, of, of these, these query plans and these trees and these, these operators going into each other, you know, a, B is not really supposed to know about A, right? So that's why it's, it's sort of this sideways information passing thing. OK. So to finish up, so the, the again, the, the German paper you guys read, they implemented all these different variants uh, that, we, that we covered. Um, Again, they're only going to look at chain hashing, uh, linear probe hashing, and then something called a concise hash table, which came from IBM. We don't need to cover that. Uh, I don't think anybody actually does that, uh, other than IBM. Um, it's basically it's, it's like a giant array with like, blue filter stuff in front of it. Um, but they're going to implement all this stuff in, into a single uh, test bed, and then they're going to have the what they deemed as the 
the unoptimized versions, or they call the white box versions of the implementations, based on reading of the papers of, of the other, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the algorithms, that or the papers that discuss the algorithms. And then they're going to have what they call their black box implementations, where they actually go through and understand what are the bottlenecks and actually try to optimize them uh, even further. So the core approaches they're going to compare against is the no partitioning hash join, uh, again, the concise hash table for IBM, and then the two pass radix hash join, either using chain hash table or linear proof hashing table. And then we'll have a special case variance of these where they're going to use just instead of a hash table, use arrays uh, because you know you have uh, monotonically increasing primary key integers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Therefore, you know exactly where to go jump into the array to find, that va you know, find the key for that value. Right? You can't always do that. <laughs> you don't, aren't always going to have keys that look like this. So again, it's nice to know see if this is the best you can actually do, but nobody actually does this. So, I'm just going to show one graph. Uh, and so the, this, you can't really see the division over here, these are all the optimized ones, the, the black box or the white box implementations, where again, they went through and op optimized them further. And then these are all the ones that are just, again, if you just read the papers, this is what they came up with. The, the sort merge join, this is what we'll cover next class. Um, so, so I realize the paper talks about it a little bit. The paper you'll read uh, after the, the, the spring break covers exactly what this approach actually is. And so these are the abbreviations, which I don't like, that they use in the paper, which is kind of confusing. Um, just some mapping to them. So again, what's the main takeaway from this? The, you know, the, the, the no partition one does better than all of them. Um, and all of these extra ones are like the additional optimizations you can do uh, to, you know, like the, the, the streaming rights and then the, the, the combined buffer output or the, the, the localized buffers. All these things, like if you do all those things and they're tuned exactly for what the Harvard actually wants them to expect and look like, then you can get uh, you know, almost 2x better performance. Right? But for this one, the no partitioning with linear probe hashing, you don't do anything. You just, you just implement it once and it runs on whatever hardware you, you have. And it does, you know, it's not as good, but it's, it's pretty good. So this is why, again, most, most systems are going to choose this. So then they have this other graph that says, okay, well, how much time are you actually spending doing joins in, in a real system? Uh, you know, relative to all the other parts you have to do, like, like producing output buffers or scanning a table and so forth. And what they show is that the, you're really spending, you know, at most 20% of the time doing hash joins for an in-memory data set with an engine like this. So the, the argument that they make is that all the actual work you do of these different algorithms to do hashing really, really efficiently doesn't maybe matter that much. And then there's other things in the system that you, you, you should be optimizing. And I would argue, actually, the query optimizer is probably the thing that has the most impact on performance, because if you have a crappy you know, uh, join ordering for your queries, it doesn't matter whether you're using an optimized hash join. It's still going to be super slow. All right? So just to show you alternative numbers, this is, again, this, this is uh, profile data that was, that was sent to us uh, by, actually, Hippocrates, the guy who, calls up to, who will talk about redshift later in the semester, because he used to work on Clutter and Pala. Um, this is the, from profiling data they sent us uh, for running TPCH on, a, on their cluster. This is how much time they, you know, their system was spending doing hash join. Now, I don't know whether this also includes network tra traffic. I don't have these numbers anymore. But you know, they argue that they're spending almost 50% of their time doing hash joins. And therefore, the, you should wor worry about making that be as efficient as, as, efficient as possible. Again, these are data numbers. I'm, I'm more inclined to believe the, the German numbers. But I just want to show these to say, OK, you may see other, kind of other numbers out there. OK? All right, so again, the main takeaway from this class is that it's kind of like I teach you stuff that say, like, OK, don't do this. But it's like dare. Like, in, like when I was growing up, like they, they show you what, how to do drugs, and they say don't do it, right? Um, and I wouldn't have known about those drugs unless they told me about them, right? Uh, so it's kind of like that. Like, hey, here's a bunch of stuff. Don't do it, which may make you go do it. I don't know. Um, but so the partition hash join is going to outperform in, in a bunch of uh, use cases than the no partition approach. But it's not, it's not trivial to implement, and it's just not worth the extra uh, engineering effort to get that last like 10% of performance. Because uh, there's, again, there's other things you, sh you should be worried about in, 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 the, in your system. And as I said, most data system vendors are going to pick one hash join implementation, one hash, hash function, and that then be done with it. And don't try to be clever about like, oh, my data looks like this, therefore I should use 
you know, radix partitioning this way or versus no partitioning that way. Everybody just, 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 just does one thing, and that's it. <laughs> that's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so y'all yeah, a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with fifth one, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>